Welcome back. We're going to continue discussing uh, sampling today, but there are a few concepts I would like to uh, make sure everyone is up to speed on before we proceed. Uh, the first is that um, we, in order to understand really what goes on with sampling, uh, we, we need to introduce a few more steps in our analysis. Uh, so far, we said the samples are just equal to the continuous time signal evaluated at periodic points uh, separated by uh, the distance t. Well, to analyze exactly what's going on there, let's introduce an intermediate step. And um, this may seem a little bit uh, strange at first, but it's, it's an important one. And that is, we're going to take our continuous time signal and multiply it by a delta function. So there are two types of delta functions. Uh, one, we've already seen it before as we've looked at plots of our discrete time signal, is one that evaluates to one when the index n is equal to zero and zero everywhere else. And we use the lowercase delta bracketed n, and this is the Kronecker delta function. The other delta function has the same behavior kind of from a big picture point of view, but instead it's operating on a continuous time. And this one is zero everywhere except at zero. At zero it does not have a value of one, but rather it has an integral of one. So how does that work? Well, if we had something like a triangle like this, and this was uh, epsilon high and epsilon wide I'm sorry this would be 1 over epsilon high then the area of that is 1 and if we uh, take the limit as epsilon approaches 0 what we get is something with support only at zero, but the area is still one, so we get an integral of one. So this is the Dirac delta function. Technically, it's not really a function, it's more uh, a class, I think, that they call a distribution, and it has very interesting properties, uh, just a few of which are one, as I've already described, I'll put this up here, that the integral over all time is equal to one. And as you saw, uh, that it's equal to zero if t does not equal to zero. And if t does equal to zero, well, we can't really say what it's equal to. Uh, it becomes infinite at that point. It has some properties that we might bring up later, uh, but one of them that's really useful Sometimes it's called the sifting property. And that is if we are multiplying a function 
by a delta. Something like this. This delta is going to evaluate everywhere to zero everywhere except where t is equal to t naught. And so the other values of x don't matter and we get this equality. Uh, so this can be used to select out certain values of x. And you can see where this is going. If we are trying to select certain values of x uh, from a continuous time signal in our steps of creating a discrete time signal, this is a helpful little property. Okay, so with that under our belts, I think we're ready to take a look at what goes on. First, I guess one or two other reminders. One is that the um, discrete time Fourier transform is defined as the sum over all samples of a discrete time signal times e raised to the negative j omega n. <clears throat> okay, now that we've got that, let's go ahead and, and figure out what's going on in the frequency domain when we're doing sampling. So, we now, here in our DFT, have an expression uh, in the frequency domain for a particular signal. So let's start there. As noted, it's a sum over all n. Uh, but now we know that this is xc of nt, e negative j omega n. And we can express xc in terms of um, its Fourier transform. So if you've had a class from me before, you know that I freely give away some of the secrets of digital signal processing. And secret number one is that you can do a majority of the proofs by either uh, doing a change of variable or changing the order of addition or integration. So we're going to do that today. First, I'll explain what I've written here as soon as I finish writing. So what's here in the middle is just an expression for xc of nt uh, in terms of its Fourier transform, capital XC of NT. I might forget to put these extra things on the X to show that it's capital, but I'll try to make it big enough that it's obvious. Okay. So now we can see we have a sum and we have an integral. Let's go ahead and change the order on these. And this will give us, you can pull the 2 pi out front. Changing the order, we get our integral here. Uh, xc j omega is not dependent on n, so it can slip outside of the sum. And now, in here, we have a sum over n. e j n. Now we get capital omega t minus little omega and then close out our integral with the d omega out front. Okay, so we're getting closer. Uh, we run into a little bit of a roadblock here. Maybe to really illustrate what that roadblock is, I'll put the fact that we have an infinite sum here. Now normally 
um, when you have an infinite sum of something that does not decay, and a complex exponential does not decay, uh, that sum is going to blow up and uh, we'll find that it doesn't exist. However, we have handy, it's quite a coincidence that we just talked about it a few minutes ago, something else that is infinite uh, and is well defined. And it turns out, and I won't prove it here, um, I recall taking a class where we did prove this, and you can take my word for it that it's true, you can look up a proof, you can ask me about it later, but it takes uh, quite a bit of groundwork to actually get to this point. But it is true nonetheless. that the infinite, an infinite sum of a complex exponential is equal to an infinite sum of Dirac deltas. So we've got two infinite things uh, equal to each other, and that's where the trickiness comes in. Uh, but this is a really useful identity. Uh, it's called the Poisson summation formula. And we can plug that into our above equation, and now we start to get something that, although it may look a little bit crazy, is getting much more useful. So we have our xc um, j omega, and that's going to be multiplied by this sum. infinite sum over k. Uh, there's a 2 pi factor there, so I'm going to delete the two, 1 over 2 pi out front and just make life a little bit easier for us. And we get a delta omega capital T minus little omega minus 2 pi k. And then we have our d omega out there. Okay, so we're getting close. Let's not give up yet. Um, we don't quite know what to do, and if we don't know what to do, remember the trick is, well, let's just start by switching the order of summation and integration. It worked before, we'll try it again. Here we go. The sums out front. The integral here is of xc j omega, and now that these two things are in juxtaposition, you can see that it wasn't just random happenstance that I happened to bring up the sifting property of Dirac deltas. So it doesn't really matter what this um, x function is anywhere except um, when the delta function argument uh, resolves to zero, or evaluates to zero. Furthermore, once we have, actually I'll go ahead and do it, and I better do it one step, we're about out of room on this page. So what we get here is one over t, and so the first question you might ask yourself is, where did the 1 over t come from? Uh, the 1 over t came from the fact that we are integrating a delta function, um, but the, the argument uh, for the independent variable is scaled by t. So the common thing to do is do a change of variable so that we just have a straight, unscaled uh, argument inside the delta, then the change of variable will give you a 1 over t outside. Basic calculus, I know that it's been 
since grade school that a lot of you have taken calculus because you're a lot smarter than your average bear. Um, but digging way back, you might remember that that's the case. Okay, next, we know that this argument, that this actually becomes a constant, xc, and here it's going to be evaluated at j times omega plus 2 pi k all over t. So when omega is equal to that, the argument of the delta function is zero. So if we if we plugged this into there, well, that didn't work really well. If we plug that into there, we find that the argument is zero. So now this term is just a constant. It's no longer a function of capital omega. Since it is no longer a function of capital omega, it can move outside uh, the integral. It might seem like fancy footwork, but it works. And what we're finally left with is just an integral of a delta function. And we know that that's equal to 1. So all of those steps put together And we get this, j omega plus 2 pi k all over capital T. There we are. So how do we interpret what's going on here? This is very important. First, um, we are taking our original continuous time spectrum and this sum over k is creating copies of it. So each copy is offset by uh, the, this, the frequency om little omega is offset by 2 pi k. So we're creating an infinite number of copies spaced by 2 pi k. Okay, so infinitely many copies 2 pi k or 2 pi apart, maybe I should say. Okay, finally, we have this T, and this T uh, dilates the spectrum. You can also think, uh, basically, it, it causes the, depending on your value of T, to spread or shrink. So it's stretching the spectrum. So, as you recall, it's skipped off the top of the page, but we have our discrete time Fourier transform, x e the j omega, is just equal to the continuous time transform stretched and replicated. So, that's the takeaway from this. Now, we've been going 20 minutes, it's time to stop. That's a good chunk to go on now, and I will talk about how this impacts aliasing in the next lecture.